Good afternoon, everyone. The theme of this talk is about whether to get the, if you get the right security products, for example, firewall, antivirus, encryption product, whether that would ensure you to have a good security. Who agrees with that? If you just have the right technology. What's missing? People. I'm glad people said that, <laughs> because that's the whole presentation. <laughs> have you heard of RSA? I'm guessing most of you do. If you don't know RSA, they do this secure ID card, so it's like two-factor authentication. So not just passwords uh, and username, but you need to put like a little code in. Did you know that RSA got hacked last year? Yeah? Do you know how they got hacked? It was via a phishing email. It was a targeted attack aimed at a few employees at RSA. So it was this, wasn't a scattergun approach like a lot of anti-spam. We heard earlier about the 419 Nigerian scam where it goes everywhere. This was a targeted attack at some employees at RSA. Now, the technology that they had in place, and you'd expect RSA being a security company, had pretty good technology to protect themselves. And it did its job because the emails went into the spam folder. One, if not two employees, went into the spam folder and said, oh, this is, looks interesting, opened it up, and double-clicked on the PDF document. Now, this PDF document had what's called, most of you will know, a zero-day vulnerability. So there was no patches available for it. So, and they were able to get onto the system, give themselves um, extra privilege, privileges on the system, and able to get the algorithm for those secure ID cards I just showed you. So the bad guys, the cyber criminals, were able to replicate the secure ID. So that was bad enough for RSA. Have you heard of Lockheed Martin? Big company in America? They got hacked. Now they got hacked because they used secure IDs. So the bad guys that, were, that hacked RSA were able to use these, what, what they got, and able to, it was only just Lockheed Martin, there were some other companies as well. So the single point of failure there was like the humans there. So I just want to give this example as to why I think the education side, and I'm using the word education um, specifically here, because I don't believe you can train someone to be secure. You can't do a, a, a training program and say, hey, come to this pro uh, training program and you will be, be a secure person after that in terms of computers. Because I don't believe you can do that. What you need to do, and I was glad, I was listening to Jeremy very intently this morning because he talked about education, awareness raising, and corporate culture. And those kind of things are the most important thing because you need to try and change people's um, mindset. It's like um, people go on dieting all the time. So maybe some people here have gone on diets and things, but diets are like a short-term thing. You go on the diet and you do it and then afterwards you go back to your old ways because you've just done it. What you should be doing is doing a lifestyle change taking up running pilates eating some healthy and just becoming more healthier and it's similar with um, security i think you have to get a culture of security within the organization and that involves everybody not just it department you need to involve sales marketing hr functions all the functions in the company needs to do that and i like to call it informed paranoia I used to be a consultant with uh, Kaspersky and everyone was telling me what settings should I have, what, what should I do, what should I allow, should I... And I says, okay, what level of paranoia do you want to operate at? If you're an advertising company, a PR agency, 
if you have a virus it's not the end of the world maybe so you might have a higher threshold f for that kind of thing if you're a security company like Kaspersky or ESET then you have to operate at the very highest level of paranoia and I'm guessing a lot of you from government organizations you have to work to pretty high level of paranoia and your security mindset uh, from top to bottom needs to be quite high as well and we need to have this engender this kind of online common sense I'm quite optimistic in my view because I think we will get there because there's a lot of people in the IT industry in our industry that says you cannot teach people to be secure they're going to use uh, bad passwords they're going to hate doing things securely but I like to think that especially the current generation that's coming along they with computers all the time then it will change over time I was here with Steve last week at the science and technology showcase and there was 700 kids around there and we you saw the password um, program application that they had in the secure security lab and we got the children to uh, put their passwords in and to see how secure it was of course we gave them Kaspersky sweets as well as we go along just to tempt them and it was really good that some of the kids you say okay put your password in some of them will s say ah oh, you won't get this it's the name of my cat <laughs> and um, so you can't guess actually she was right I was trying to guess it was like Tiddles, Tigger or, and I couldn't guess it but I was trying to explain that the program if you, if you had a um, would be able to guess her thing was I think it was like four or five digits or something kind of her, her thing and we, we tried to say it's not a very strong password but some others though and I've never seen this before I was here last year as well they picked up the keyboard and made sure no one was shoulder surfing and putting in the their password and they've learned that somehow and it's coming to them and the very security sorry maybe but they've learned from bad experience possibly that's how a lot of us learn but I these were ten nine ten year old kids and they were trying to be security conscious so I'm quite um, I'm quite optimistic shall I say and I think over time when those kids grow up ho I'm hoping that they will be security conscious. I'm just going to show you this video. You will be within six miles of home for doing less than 30. And it's going to happen to a lot of you ladies. You'll be shopping, collecting the kids, going to the laundry. For some of you, the face you'll start out with in the morning won't be the same face you end up with by the evening. Why well, does it happen? Code click, it's so simple. Open the car door. Do you remember that? Some people are too young here to remember that, I think. So if you say no, that's probably a good thing. <laughs> Clunk click every trip. That was run from the early 70s and it was backed up in the 80s uh, with a legal framework as well where you had to clunk click every trip. Now, who here do not do that when they drive? Does anybody here not clunk click every trip? There's two things going on here. Even if you do not put a seatbelt, it's become like a social kind of taboo not to admit to. Now, if I'd asked the same question in 1965, say, if you were here, I'm pretty much sure no one would care if you knew whether they put a seatbelt on. So I do believe that over time, attitudes can change it's not like we're fighting a losing game things can change and I'm thinking not just with passwords but with lots of other things things will change and so education is very important not training education r awareness raising and we're going to start this today because I'm going to start asking you some questions as well a little bit later but the first place needed to start and this goes back to earlier people saying as well is the security policy I won't go through this but uh, I've told Steve to whoever wants this um, can have it's just some guidelines what you need to put in a security policy 
and it's including things like social networks and things like that as well what you should and what you shouldn't do it's just my guideline it's not um, gone through any kind of verification elsewhere so the very first thing you need to do with HR is set up the security policy and then once you've done that you can then inform all uh, the employees And I'll give you an example of Kaspersky, because of course that's where I come from, and this is what we do. Everybody that joins a company in the UK, and we've got about 130 people now, needs, as well as other inductions, need to do a malware awareness course. So they will c come with me, it's like a one-to-one -one normally, uh, me or one of my colleagues, and we will go through, tell them what a virus is, what a worm, just the overview whether the admin person marketing sales HR technical person all of them go through this malware awareness course and we update it as well the other thing I'm involved in um, we were saying before that everyone's using Facebook everyone's using Twitter the new generation uh, coming up now going to the workplace if you don't allow them to do that they, they will just go somewhere else they're just so used to it they will expect to use these services so you will have to allow them to do that but what I do is I like to treat people as adults and say you have choices here to, what to do so we're now running me and my colleague we run actual workshop social networking with we get them with some Facebook accounts and say okay set the privacy levels look into that we tell them to Google themselves, what can they find information can they can find out, all sorts of things. We can f get people's registration numbers, we can get their addresses, and a lot of time they're very surprised about what information they can find on the internet. So it's just trying to change their mindset about what to share and what not to share. And especially on Facebook. Um, does anybody know who owns your, f your f photo or pictures you put on the Facebook? Who owns those photos? It's kind of a trick question when I ask that because actually Facebook does not own the photos you put on there. To their credit they say the photos are yours but what you do is give them worldwide royalty free license to use your photo in anything they want. They can sell it to a third party, they can use it for sponsored ads, they can do anything with that did, any, did it, anybody know that? Yeah? Exactly. So, now, if you're happy for Facebook to use your image, and by the way, if you've taken pictures of other people, it's your photograph, it, um, it assumes that you've got their permission to put their, your fo the, that photo onto Facebook. It just assumes it. It's in the uh, small print if you read it. So that's just one case of things. So this is where the ra awareness raising comes into. If, you, if you're happy to put your photos onto Facebook now, that's fine because it's informed. You, you know about it. So we do lots of these things at, at Kaspersky because you know, me personally and my colleague David M, we take a quite active role in trying to make sure everybody in the company um, um, do this and similar with like passwords you need to get buy-in from people why to use complex password because if you tell enforce something like say you need 10 characters you need uppercase lowercase you need special characters then they might comply because they have no choice but they'll hate you for it because they don't want to do that. It's just so annoying to have to think up of this kind of password. But then if you go in, show them Steve's app and put in a password they think is secure, and they says, okay, why don't you do this and do that and see how fast this can be broken, whether it's in this ten, top 10,000 list of um, passwords that people use, then there's more likely that they will use secure passwords so and also they'll stop writing it on a 
post-it note and put it in, in front of their monitor as well, which I've seen as well. So, but it's all about getting buy-in from employees to use the technology in the way that we want them to. Let's just take a back step now about and talk to you about cybercrime and the reasons why. In the morning, Alan was talking about the the malware business as a whole. I just wanted to pick up on one thing. This is something we call spyware 2.0. Spyware 1 was when they would just um, go for your uh, credit card details, login information. It was just that. Whereas now, what we think, it's we're an age of steal everything. Now for personal people as well as businesses, it's um, quite important because they're not just after credit card information they are after any kind of information they can get and they will troll the internet they will troll Twitter Facebook for these kind of information and the things that they're going for as well as credit card and login information is what operating system does your organization use what um, applications that you use and then what they will do is say, I say, I hate Office 2010 and I don't like X um, antivirus product. So the bad guys, what they have to do, they don't have to create a malware for every to uh, encapsulate everything. When if I'm targeting your organization, what they will do is, okay, they use Office 2010 what vulnerabilities are there in Office 2010 I can use. They use this antivirus. Okay, what malware I can use to bypass the security. Notice I don't have to bypass the security of all antivirus. I just need that one particular antivirus to bypass, not all of them. And all this information can be found uh, from going through Facebook and lots of other places as well. So the doing all that information, getting all this phone, but then using that information in a very targeted way, like in such a case as RSA hack. We did last year a global IT security, and most of you can't see this from the back, but you'll get the slides later as well, um, about targeted attacks in organization. Now, about 30% feel that they are being specifically targeted by cyber attacks but only one in ten ten percent admitted to being part having uh, been a target of a targeted attack. so but I think probably that number is much higher it's just that the, either they have not reported it or they don't know that they've been part of a targeted attack and I've seen even much quite small organizations like estate agents and things being targeted because of course they've got databases to protect. Right, we're going to have a game of the weakest link here, my version. It's the nice version, not the Anne Robinson version. So I'm going to show you something, a phishing email, and then I want to see what your reaction will be. Okay. This is example one. This is from Mrs. Maria Peer. This is a message from Mrs. Maria Peer in Queen's Hospital. Please kindly read the attached message and reply back to her. And there's a document there called Mrs. Maria Peer. Okay? Okay. Who here would just be open the document because they're curious? Anybody? Number two. I would save the document to the desktop and then open it. Anybody? Third option. I would save the document, scan it using an internet security program, of course up to date, and then only if it's clean open it. Who would open it then? Great, I like everybody here. Who would just delete the message? Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, Mrs. Maria Peer, I don't know anybody. Does anybody know Maria Peer? Or a Maria in Queen's Hospital? It's possible, I guess. Is there a Queen's Hospital in Plymouth? Okay, 
so it's probably less likely. It's got strange subject mission and things. So most of us here, and I'm guessing. And it's also got three R's in the uh, address. It's got three R's in the address. Well, ah, oh, it does. Yeah. I did not spot that. Well done, gold star there. So, okay, this is a, an easy one. I'm going to give you a, a another one now. This is example two. I'm going to pick on Steve actually because I like picking on Steve. Okay. So, right, you don't have CEO, but you have vice chancellor. You, this comes from your vice chancellor, yes. So just pretend this is from your vice chancellor. And on here, it's got all the vice chancellors, all the deans, and it says the bonus plan for 2013. It's, it's not come to you, it's, it's got a John. I'm guessing in Plymouth University you've got a John somewhere. Got a, few, yeah. a few people called John. It says, hey John, here's the bonus plan for the manageable. So, and it's regards your, C, your vice chancellor. Would you be tempted to just double click on that director's bonus plan? I'd be tempted, but I wouldn't do it. You wouldn't do it? Yeah? So you can see, okay, the first one was quite a trivial matter. Now the second one is a targeted attack one. It's coming from a legitimate email address because remember, they would have done the they would have gone to a lot more effort to find out who the vice chancellor of Plymouth University is and most of you know here you can send an email address and the from can be from anything it can be Mickey Mouse at Disney.com if you wanted it to and it's deliberately not put Steve's name there it's put a John and assuming there would be a John in in the Plymouth University and saying a message about the bonus plan it's something to entice someone to double click on that thing. I would be very tempted to actually double click on that so the bad guys they are still doing what we call the low hanging fruit they're still doing the spam messages they're still doing the 419 uh, kind of scams from the Nigerian scam letters and because it's very easy for them and it's not a lot of investment for, to do that but more and more we're getting these kind of targeted attacks <coughs> and it's mainly like phishing emails is coming in that looks very real and we have to recognize that all of us in this room and in our organization we're valuable to the cyber criminals so and a lot of you here will have access to lots of sensitive data personal data, company data, uh, data about source code for the company because they, they will go after source code as well and and a lot of time as well it's the top management or the PA to the top management that they will um, try to target because a lot of top management of course won't read their emails or it's been read by all PAs and HR sales as well thing. and the social engineering tricks are the same. In the last 20 years I've been involved um, in the security, it's the same social engineering tricks, but it's in, in a different way. Um, first it was kind of emails and uh, instant messaging, and now social networks, Twitter, Facebook, and, and so forth, that they're using. But it's the same kind of tricks that they're using. So, and every different type of phishing email or other things it's slightly different so you can't train someone to say okay don't click on these ones because these are phishing emails they have to try and notice the signs now are they really likely by accident to get an email giving the bonus plan for the top management probably not probably not I won't go through all these again, but again you can get it from the, the slides later, but for me what I think really is that 
education is really important. It's, it's kind of seen as the soft side of uh, our industry it's, and it's not really given the time, I think, and effort and the money put <coughs> towards it. But trying to change people's mindset can work, as, you, as we talked about the clunk click every trip. That did work. It took many, many years for it to work though, backed up by legislation as well. So it needs a number of things to happen for, for it to work. And for system administrators, uh, you have to employ secure passwords, all the, the good things. But the important part of that, you need to get the buy-in from the staff as well. You, your life will be much easier if you set up a, a workshop, give them the Plymouth University's password application, try and work out why it is you should have good secure passwords. And you can tell them, for example, at home, you, it's not a bad thing to write your passwords down, just lock it away. The cyber criminals are not going to be able to come down the wire and to be able to go to your locked uh, drawer to get the password. So it's not a problem writing your passwords down. In some situations, it's a good idea. So that way you can ensure to have different passwords for all different sites. Because we say you should use multiple passwords, but that's kind of painful ev uh, for, for everybody. Even IT professionals like us here, it's a pain for us to have lots of different passwords. So it's, you can write some of them down. Or use a, um, one of the things that I do is have a passphrase and then change it for every different site. So if I go to Amazon, I'll use a capital A, say, or Facebook, capital F somewhere, and then I have a kind of a passphrase and then you, and it'll be different to every single different site. So you can give them these kind of ideas as well. So you need to get, actually get by them. Yeah? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Ralph.